in secret knowledge. Artist Kazimir Malievich on her architecture. In secret knowledge. I felt that all these things I discovered was through abstraction. They could read the abstract drawing. It was the first time I realized how my mind worked. I was so obsessed with this work when I was studying and when I was early career that I went over it over and over again. I think one of the curious parallels between Malevich and Zahar is, is this desire from very early on to want to be truly modern, to question every convention, every premise. It allowed us to see space differently. It, it made her think about weightlessness in architecture. And that's really the way that she's developed ever since. What I think is extraordinary is to be able to have energy from a very simple thing like the black square. I mean, at the time, you know, this came out uh, of nowhere almost. Association and some of the people who taught her there at the time think that she was in some ways looking for something when she arrived. And then suprematism suddenly hit her like an express train. And when you are in a bleak economic period, which is what the 70s were, when you're being assaulted on all sides by people who think that your work is somehow wrong and misguided, that sense of going back to anything being possible was very liberating. Depending behind, uh, it's called the Menevich Tectonic, which is, uh, was a name of the project which we did uh, in my fourth year. The tectonic is the one in the middle with shadows around it, and the pieces which are around the painting. So one is seeing it from a plan view, and one is seeing it from an aerial view. Of course, it was very influenced by all the paintings by Menevich, by the suprematists, and by other abstract pieces, the whole idea of block color and also fragmentation. The actual tectonic is also fragmented or broken. So this is in its process of kind of like its orbiting um, before it lands on Hungerford Bridge. I was very fascinated by abstraction and, uh, and how it really could lead to abstracting plans, uh, moving away from kind of um, certain dogmas about what architecture is. And I, that, that project really liberated me, let's say, or freed me from all these rules.
she was trying to think through the possibilities of what might happen if there was a building that Bowditch had made, completely speculative architecture, and yet in her mind it was always real, it was going to get built sooner or later. Well, it was very interesting in terms of Zadid looking at Malevich's architectons at the moment that she did. At that stage, really, um, East and West were fully divided, and this was a deep ideological division. So for a very young architect to look back at a Russian revolutionary artist and say, this is my elected affinity, this is how I see my work, was a very radical gesture. What is very easy to forget is when you see these works today in a gallery setting, it's the context of the time in which they were made. As Malevich began to push towards abstraction, this coincides with the outbreak of the First World War. It's very interesting then that the artists are the ones who are the first really to push forward, who express this desire for something new, for building a new world. Squares rather could only because at the time it came out was such an amazing thing. Supremism was to achieve total simplicity and also the whole movement was very mystical and uh, that's why it comes with some, uh, such amazing power, the square. When it was done at the time, the move from figurative art and cubism to this abstraction was an amazing leap and to achieve that was really incredible. He called it the end of the beginning. What he's doing is saying the old regime is collapsing and we need to find a means of understanding the world differently. Malevich set out to really question what is painting and what is art. I think that holds huge inspiration for an architect like Zahadid, who it also seems to me, with every project, again, sets out to question the fundamental parameters. How does a building function? How does it relate to its environment? The top corner of the room, he showed the black square. Now, that was a very particular choice. That spot, usually in a traditional Russian household, was reserved for an icon, for a religious painting, which was seen not as a painting, not as an art object, but as an object of devotion. And even if Malevich himself didn't outrightly intend it as such, it was immediately read as that by the critics. So they immediately commented on that and said, this is blasphemy, this is outrageous. Supremacism for Malevich was a very important step. Broadly speaking, it involved using geometry in painting, mostly oil on canvas, carefully painted up to the edges, the geometric forms. Interestingly, he chose to show the individual paintings in a way that mirrored the arrangements of the colors and shapes within the individual paintings. So they were scattered all over the walls. There was an incredible sense of movement and dynamism. I think he intended also to show it as a, as a whole world. I mean, obviously in that show in, in Russia, it was much more uh, dense. There were more pieces. There was, you know, a consistent randomness. They were not displaced as curators show things now where uh, even displaced, but they're shown all together almost haphazardly. And that was, I think, definitely very intentional. I like uh, the, the, the whole composition because it implies also that these are a part of a kind of uh, universe and they work together and then when you zoom in you see certain clusters together like a galaxy or whatever. What I think it taught me is composition. It looks very fragmented and very chaotic but there was always a kind of equilibrium to the composition. 
And I felt that all these things I discovered was through abstraction, because I have understood, like I could read the abstract drawing, but for the first time I realized that actually how my mind worked and how I can resolve a problem. Because before that, like most students, and I always would do the same, like stare at, at a board for days to have an idea. And I realized you have to really organize your thinking. become increasingly interested in outer space and rockets or the idea of rockets trip to the moon some of these things coming from H.G. Wells and Jules Verne who were read in Russia but the idea was catching on and um, I called Tsiolkovsky for example was the, the first of the great rocket theorists and he became very popular and he wrote stories about revolution in space and um, the idea that uh, mankind was born to live in space so is all a bit mystical, but he was in the air at the time. He was very um, interested in the idea of leaving earthbound reality behind, of not being confined by the laws of logic. Sometimes he would rotate an individual painting sideways or even 180 degrees. But sometimes I think he could even imagine that he could put them up on the ceiling or down on the ground. Um, and they would take on a different notion of either of these shapes rising into infinity or very quickly when you put them on the ground you could see quite easily how you could turn them into an architectural plan or an architectural drawing. Instead of mailing everyone my vacation photos I'm saving a ton of time by posting them to my wall. Ooh, I like that one. It's so quick. It's just like my car insurance. I save 15% in just 15 minutes. I save more than that in half the time. I'd unfriend you. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. 15 minutes for a quote isn't how it works anymore. With eSurance, seven and a half minutes could save you on car insurance. Welcome to the modern world. eSurance, backed by Allstate. Click or call. The following is an important message for all men. Are you urinating more frequently? Do you wake up to urinate? Are you having a slower, weaker stream? By 50, half of all men already have a prostate issue, and it only gets worse with age. Don't ignore the warning signs of an aging prostate. Call or go online in the next 10 minutes, and we'll ship you a free 30-day supply of Super Beta Prostate, the best-selling non-prescription formula for prostate support. Super Beta Prostate is guaranteed to support a more complete emptying of your bladder, a fuller, stronger stream, and less waking at night to urinate. Super Beta Prostate has a trusted 10-year history in prostate care, having shipped over 6 million bottles. So I've gotten used to getting up multiple times a night and, you know, I kind of adapted to that. You might say I thought that was maybe normal. And once I started taking Super Beta, now it's down to zero. Now with Super Beta, I find that I can comfortably get to my destination without the concern of this uncontrollable urge to want to use the bathroom. The Super Beta Prostate is a product that I really like. I endorse it. I use it myself. I have done the research on the ingredients. I was very pleasantly surprised that Super Beta Prostate helped me fairly quickly. Super Beta Prostate is available without a prescription. It's formulated with a special and natural plant enzyme called beta cytosterol, which was shown in multiple clinical studies to support healthy prostate function. Super Beta Prostate is so powerful, you'd have to take 100 Sol Palmetto pills to get the same sterols as just one Super Beta Prostate tablet. So don't ignore the warning signs of your aging prostate. Get your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate today. Due to extremely limited supplies, only one free bottle per household. Call right now to get your free bottle while it's still free. Go to superbeta.com or call 800-497-4080. 800-497-4080. 800-497-4080.
Malevich explains the theory of color. He talked about white, the white background, as symbolizing infinity. And in the early stages of suprematism, the color rests atop of white. Interestingly, in 1916, he gets called up to arms. In 1917, there's the um, October Revolution. After that, when he returns to making abstract paintings, white becomes far more dominant. And I think there's a sense that slowly the shapes disappear, and with the shapes disappears the whole notion of art making as we had known it until then. What I like about it is that it has one very hard edge. It's a geometric form, but it, what I call it wishes to the edge. So it goes almost to infinity. The, the, the space beyond on the right, you don't know where it's going. It could go at infinite space. So the idea of this gradation is also very interesting. Like, oh, it's not a pure form, but it's gradated form. I find that very exciting. The two bits of film I've seen of him, he's pushing people out of the way and saying, look out, I'm here, I've arrived, you know, follow me. And he did say on one occasion, first there was the Old Testament, then the New Testament, and here's the Testament of Supremacy. Personally, I think he was very interested in um, mythical ideas and a certain degree of mysticism. I'm sure he was aware that the cross is one of those uh, forms, geometric shapes, that is highly ambiguous. So even if you said it's nothing more than a simple bold geometric shape, it is impossible to read it as such because the cultural determinism is too strong. When we see a cross, we will have certain associations. I think there was a fascination with obviously the cross, but also uh, at the bottom of the cross there are other kind of supremacist lines. But this could be seen in many different scales. I mean, it could be the scale of a very large globe. It could be a scale of kind of moving spaceship or a moving object in space. Or it could be seen as a domestic scale where the lines are a wall or a desk or a chair. So you can actually domesticate these uh, compositions. If you go and look at something like the Olympic Pool, which is the largest thing she's done in London. It has that painterly quality. There's no sense of structure. You, there's an awful lot of steel holding up that roof, but you don't see it, she denies it. She's the opposite of a high-tech architect. She does magic with space. You wouldn't mistake her work for Malevich, but there is this dynamism. She has a kind of calligraphic fluency, which is not his, you know, because she's quite a different person, different architect, but it's as if he sprang this release. These artificial drawings are very beautiful pencil drawings, they're very simple. It explores the three dimensionality because there is a connection between some of these uh, works and some of the paintings and the kind of the different layers or the pieces which are next to each other uh, against a spine. So it moves from two-dimensional to three-dimensional work. And these are implications, also implications of his interest in architecture. Uh, and that's why I find them fascinating. And I think this one is particularly nice where it shows that many different compositions, but it also shows plan, aerial view, section, elevation all together. buildings. They don't have any practical purpose, so they don't think about doorways, windows, rules of access, all the things that an architect would have to think about. It's a dream um, world. It's the notion really of um, pushing forward into an unknown terrain and developing an architectural utopia. He called them things like um, dwelling for ordinary earthlings or, uh, <laughs> you know, a house in space and this kind of thing. So they're a provocation, and, um, but they're full of ideas, and they appear weightless in many ways. There's a famous photo montage of a view of the New York skyscrapers, 
through which one of these architectons goes flying through. I seem to say, well, they're very clever, these Americans, but these are going to fly. There obviously was an ambition through him and his students to insert suprematism into architecture. I mean, he intended the frame to be built, but I think they had not yet maybe discovered how to build them. There were all these ambitions in Europe and Germany and everywhere and in Russia to build a new world. So it meant to kind of strip the old world from their old traditions and habits and build a new world which deals with the new situation. And um, I just think it's a shame that, you know, modernism or modernity, let's say, uh, was uh, always aborted by a changing government or a war or whatever. And so these revolutions were always uh, curved or stopped. came to Vitebsk to work there as a teacher and work together with his students, they very rapidly thought about all kinds of um, ideas, all fields of application, how you could translate suprematism into a new language for a new social order. So on the one hand, they set out to design new objects, and uh, in the exhibition we have a cup, which is like only one half of a cup, or we've got a teapot which looks like an architecton translated into a utilitarian object. But more often than not, they actually had to use the china, the porcelain, that was left over from before the revolution. So that it was actually simple white porcelain in very traditional shapes, which they then began to paint in suprematist designs. It's very tectonic. That's what is interesting about it. So it has I mean, the obsession with this kind of these, what I call tic-tics or small pieces applying everywhere. Uh, it's even applied to the teapot. Like, you know, this is like a painting, whether it's a big square or a small square. Um, these additions like, a, like the tectonic. So it's one ideology applying to everything. It's like a signature. You know, they, they sign everything in the same way. I personally find very touching and moving when you look at the late work is that first you have this uh, real desire to invent yet another different type of language. So now it mixes figuration and abstraction. But what I find is very curious is that um, at that point Malevich very often signed his work with the black square, including his own self-portrait. So he very clearly seems to be saying, I made this, I'm the author of this, I'm not denouncing this, but now I made something very different. I think that it was a symbol, you know. I mean, it was like maybe like a branding, not to say it in the most cynical way, but I think it was his, his sign. As he fell ill and knew that he was soon going to die, he carefully began to plan his funeral. He instructed one of his students, Suetin, to work on his coffin. This was set up, he was uh, laid out on his bed, dying, the coffin was standing there. The coffin mimicked a supremacist design. There's a black square hanging above, there's a circle, there's a cross, all the elementary shapes. And in the end, as he um, had died and the funeral procession moved through the city, a black square was mounted on front of the uh, car. People were waving flags with the black square and lo and behold, his gravestone became a black square also. see all that work again and reminds you again of the power of that period and that work. It is also great to see it all together in one space. Well, I think that my fascination with Malevich uh, many years ago is different than it is now. I'm still very moved by them, but they obviously they're intended for something else. I see them, I now read them always as a painting applying an architecture, and I'm not sure that that was always intentional. They are almost like kind of floating worlds. And, and what I think it implied in architecture is that 
obviously they don't literally float. Maybe eventually there'll be time when buildings are no longer uh, need a kind of gravity uh, to land on the ground. They just hover above ground. But um, but in this case, they like to form a, a kind of a galaxies or worlds, and I find that really very exciting. Nobody knows it all, but we all know a little something. And if those little somethings came together, we could do almost anything. Like windows that turn sunlight into electricity. It may seem like magic, but it's simply chemistry. The same chemistry that can make plastic bags compostable and wind turbines more durable. Good connections today can make for a better tomorrow. That's why we don't just make chemicals, we create chemistry. BASF, the chemical company. Choosing Basic Talk for low-cost home phone service could save you up to $70 up front versus the other guy. Plus, it's free to keep your number. But if you don't believe me, listen to this reliable news anchor. It's been confirmed. Choosing Basic Talk for low-cost home phone service.